Thanks for listening to the Mornings with Carmen LaBerge podcast, made available thanks to support from listeners just like you. Inspiring you to bring God back into the conversation of the day. This is Mornings with Carmen LaBerge on Faith Radio. If we're gonna fly, we fly like eagles, arms out wide. If we're gonna fear, we fear no evil. We will rise by your power. We will go by your spirit. We are bold. If we're gonna stand, we stand as giants. If we're gonna walk, we walk as lions. Good morning, friend. Good morning, friend. Um, how does God love thee? Let me count the ways on this Valentine's Eve. I thought it would be fun for us to consider together how God loves us. So how does God love thee? Let me count the ways. Now, you could approach this question of how does God love you from a lot of different angles. So here's my list. You you are certainly welcome to add to it. Um, How would you answer the question, how does God love you? You can text me. Uh, text line's always open, 877-933-2484. How does God love thee? Let me count the ways. So here's my list. God loves you as father, eldest brother, bridegroom, companion, and friend. God loves you from eternity past. God loves you in the present and into eternity yet to come. God loves you with all that he is, all that he has all that he does, and all that he says. God loves you out of every aspect of his being. God loves you with love that is holy, infinite, unchanging, all-seeing, all-knowing, always present, and ever faithful. God loves you with love that is almighty, first and last, merciful, gracious, tender, and strong. God loves you with God's love. Hmm, I didn't really write that correctly. God loves you with joy and wisdom. God's love is restorative and patient beyond your imagination. God loves you with love that is transcendentally good, beautiful, and true. God loves you in all the languages of love. God loves you with words of affirmation, quality time, gifts, physical touch, acts of service. God loves you. How do I know? The Bible tells me so. How does God love you? Count the ways today. Count the ways today. Bob says on the text line, God loves me as benevolent king. Another friend says, God loves me with his arms always wide open. God loves you with deep affection. God loves you with a love that pursues you to hell and back. God loves you. Jesus affirms that the first and greatest commandment is that we are to love God, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. Are you loving God today with your all in all? I want to encourage you for Valentine's Day. It's Valentine's Day Eve, by the way. Consider reading a love letter from God. Try John chapter 4 or 1 Corinthians 13 or Romans 12. And then dwell for some time on John 3.16. Just think about what God has said about love and about his love for us. Maybe you could consider writing your own love letter to God today. Maybe you could consider being the love letter that God is sending to someone else today to express his love. Maybe maybe you want to sing God a love song today. What what would a love song that you could sing to God sound like? What what would that sound like if you were to sing a love song to God today? Write him a love letter, be his love letter to someone else, sing him a love song today. As I was considering that question, <clears throat> the song that came to mind was Be Thou My Vision. So I want you to listen to the words of Be Thou My Vision, because that might not have been what came to mind for you when I suggested you sing God a love song, but this is the song that came to my mind. 
Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art thou my best thought. By day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Be thou my wisdom, and thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, and I thy true child. Thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. Riches I heed not, nor vain empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure thou art. High King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun, heart of my own heart, whatever befall. Still be my vision, O ruler of all. Heart of my own heart. Um, now and always mine, dwelling in and with me. My light, my wisdom, my true word, my best thought. Lord of my heart. Could you sing God a love song today? Friend, when all other loves fail or fade away, the love of God remains, and you can count on the love of God today. Let him be your valentine. And then, knowing that you're loved, having been so loved, filled with real love, commanded to love, I want you to allow yourself to be the love that God is sending by his spirit into a world that is desperate for love. Happy Valentine's Eve as we prepare in advance to follow the command of Christ to love one another as in Christ Jesus God has loved us. No greater love. No greater love. Our friend Jeff Barrows is going to join us next from the Christian Medical and Dental Association. One of the questions that was in my Monday mailbag I passed along to the good doctor. One of the questions that you asked was about um, Whole30. You guys ask actually a lot of questions about, you know, hey, maybe during Lent I should give up uh, eating sugar altogether or I should give up, you know, this or that. What does the good doctor have to say about that? Well, today we're going to talk about maybe positively uh, eating whole foods and what does that actually look like and and what, what good would it be? So, listener question from the Monday mailbag on this Tuesday as the good doctor helps us taste and see what is good. That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. Our brother in Christ and friend, the good doctor, Jeff Barrows, is back from the Christian Medical and Dental Association, uh, cmda.org. All right, Jeff, uh, we're going to taste and see that the Lord is good. This is a listener question. Whole 30, is it good? What are your thoughts on uh, what and how we should be eating? Well, good morning, Carmen. Uh, I do have a few thoughts on it. I guess the first thing I would point out is that This is a 30-day cleansing diet. That's the reason it's called Whole30. It's not a long-term diet. So as a cleansing diet, it has some pros and some cons. So first of all, the positives. Uh, It does allow for a reset after periods of, for instance, poor nutrition or stress eating, which can be a good thing. Uh, Secondly, for those who suffer from GI problems that may be related to certain food groups, it can help them identify those food groups and then adjust their diet accordingly. And the third positive is it's been around for a while. I guess it was started around 2009, so we've had it for 15 years. So it's been tested in that way. But on the negative side, it is not well-researched, and people need to know that. It is low in fiber. Again, not a big deal because you're only using the diet for about 30 days. But for those that are predisposed to constipation, it might increase their, their tendency that way while they're on the diet. But more importantly, because it's cutting out certain absolute food groups, it has the potential of triggering someone with an eating disorder such as anorexia nervosa. And last, I should point out that it is not meant for pregnant women or nursing mothers. So 
On the good side, if it's used properly in the short term, it could benefit those who are struggling with certain GI issues and certain food groups. But to remind your listeners, if you're looking at the best long-term diet, my recommendation remains the Mediterranean diet, which is essentially the diet that Jesus ate, as well as the DASH diet, which is very closely related. DASH was the second one? Yes, it stands for Dietary Approach to Stop Hypertension. It's very similar to the Mediterranean diet with more emphasis on limiting salt. Hmm. All right. I'm going to look that one up. All right. So um, thank you for that. Uh, you guys know that you can you can drop any kind of question you want into the text line. And if, uh, if I'm not the appropriate person to answer it, you know, I will ask uh, one of our um, very well-informed expert guests uh, to address it when they come on. So thank you, Jeff, for your willingness to take that listener question. Uh, Toby Keith is um, a high-profile individual um, who, you know, sings a song track uh, for many, many of us. Um, he died recently from stomach cancer. Can you talk with us about um, maybe what we need to know about stomach cancer? And uh, I understand it is often missed until it's too late. Yeah, you're exactly right. It's one of those cancers that doesn't show itself early on and typically shows itself late. So this was this was a tragic loss, of course. And Toby was only 62 when he, he died. He had been diagnosed with stomach cancer in the fall of 2021 and just lived about two and a half years after the diagnosis was made. Stomach cancer, it's a cancer of the lining of the stomach. So the cancer as a mass has the ability to grow into this empty space, which is why it doesn't show itself early on. And even when symptoms do start, they tend to be what we call nonspecific. There's nothing unusual about them initially, at least until very late. So it's unfortunately the fifth most common cancer worldwide. It's a little more common in certain ethnic groups like African Americans, Hispanic individuals, and even Asian and Pacific Islanders. And Again, as is shown by uh, this particular case with Toby, it's uh, more common, twice as common, actually, in men as it is in women. So there are certain risk factors. Uh, your listeners may have heard of a bacteria called H. pylori, which is common. It gets into the stomach, doesn't cause any symptoms. And uh, it does tend to live there chronically. And once you have that, does that does raise your risk a little bit, along with being overweight, uh, having gastroesophageal reflux disease, a family history. And this is where diet comes in. If your diet is very low in fruit and vegetables, you're putting yourself at a little bit greater risk of stomach cancer, along with smoking and certain environmental exposures. So once the symptoms start, as I said, they're nonspecific. You just kind of feel a little bloated, a little bit of mild nausea, loss of appetite. Maybe the heartburn is increasing a little bit. But those are so nonspecific, it's rare that somebody's going to go to a doctor right away and be checked out for stomach cancer. It isn't until it gets to the point where they begin vomiting, especially vomiting blood, uh, have weight loss and increasing stomach pain that they finally see the physician and it's looked into. So prognosis typically is not very good. It's, it's dependent on how far along you are. And so my recommendation to your listeners, if you do have high risk factors such as chronic stomach problems or gastroesophageal reflux disease, make sure you're followed by your uh, healthcare professional. And if there's a change in symptoms, uh, get in to see them and consider being evaluated by what's known as an upper endoscopy, which will make the diagnosis. Hmm. Um, Jeff, tomorrow is Valentine's Day. Many of us are going to get a box of chocolates or we are going to give a box of chocolates. Um, dark chocolate versus milk chocolate versus white chocolate, which in fact is not chocolate at all. Can we talk a little bit about the health benefits of, of, of any of them? Uh, the main one is dark chocolate, uh, and uh, there's some really good reasons, interesting reasons, uh, and my Valentine uh, fortunately loves dark chocolate, so I don't have to worry about what to buy my Valentine, but dark chocolate contains higher concentrations of cocoa, which gives it the dark color, and you're right, uh, white chocolate will not is not an essence chocolate. It's not and chocolate. And this cocoa... 
Yeah, it's it's lots and lots of sugar, too much sugar. But uh, cocoa contains a chemical called flavanols, and uh, it's about two to three times the quantity of flavanols in dark chocolate as in milk chocolate. It unfortunately does make the chocolate have a little bit more bitter flavor, which is why a lot of people tend to avoid it. But these flavanols are really critical in our very small blood vessels, like our capillaries, the small arteries and small veins, because they get into the lining of those blood vessels and they kind of uh, in increase the production of certain chemicals that relax these blood vessels. So that improves blood flow, it lowers blood pressure, it also lessens inflammation. And by the way, it does have a tendency to increase sensitivity to insulin. So preliminary evidence has shown that when you have a fair amount of cocoa intake, you're likely to have decrease in heart disease, probably through reduced blood pressure and decreased inflammation. So now you do have to keep in mind, even dark chocolate is high in calories, so you don't wanna get too much, uh, have increased weight gain. So obviously like so many things, the best benefit is eating in moderation. So my advice to your listeners, if they haven't bought their Valentine in the chocolate yet, to at least consider making some of it dark chocolate and even consider mixing it with some nuts like almonds. Mm -hmm. All right, dark chocolate almonds, put those on the list for uh, what to send Carmen for Valentine's, although I need maybe at this point like delayed Valentine's because Lent begins tomorrow. And so, yeah, it's all complicated this year because I don't know. Are you going to set your chocolate aside for the 40 days and you're going to wait till Easter to eat it? I don't know because it's Easter candy, not Valentine's candy. You do the math. Um, we'll be back in just a moment with jo Dr. Jeff Barrows from the Christian Medical and Dental Association. We're going to talk about the correlation between religious attendance and um, what's going on in your brain. Um, how, how can it actually be good for your brain health, um, for your cognitive health, to be participating actively in the life of a religious community? That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. What season of life are you in right now? season of life? There are lots of ways to answer that question. So what season of life are you in right now? You may feel as if you are in a season of hopeful expectation or a season of desperation. You may feel as if you are in a dry season or a rainy season or maybe a season of abundance. Maybe this is a transitional season for you. What season of life are you in right now? Let me say first that you're not alone in whatever season you are in. And let me also say that God wants to meet you and be with you in that current season, even in that season of wilderness or dryness. And God wants to lead you through that current season to the next one. Discover what God is doing in your life now and where he's leading next at this year's Set Apart Conference for Women, it's March 8 and 9 at the University of Northwestern St. Paul. You can register today at setapartconference.com. That's setapartconference.com. Cognitive decline and aging um, have been in the news of late, um, and my guess is that if you are of an age, then you are experiencing some level of cognitive decline. Um, how might you mitigate that? What are, what's something you could positively be engaging in um, that, that might mitigate against cognitive decline? Well, maybe um, going to church might be on that list. Dr. Jeff Barrows is here from the Christian Medical and Dental Association. Jeff, is there a correlation between um, religious attendance actually being engaged in the life of a religious community and mitigating against cognitive decline? Well, Carmen, fortunately there is. And as you may have realized, I'm always interested as a Christian in finding well-done studies that support uh, really a positive association between our Christian faith and health. And in this case, of course, we're talking about 
mental health. So this was a study done at Baylor University, and it was published in a peer-reviewed journal. What that means is that it's a journal that has every article reviewed by other experts uh, to make sure that it was well done and that the conclusions are well-founded. And what these researchers did is they looked at a group of a little over 4,700 participants over a 35-year span between 1979 and 2015. So uh, this is what makes the study a little bit unusual because this is a long-term study. And they assessed their religious attendance at the beginning of the study in 1979 and then again in the year 2000. And the categories they created were three different categories. If they only attended uh, religious services a couple of few times a year, it was obviously low. If they attended one to three times a month, they called that moderate. But those that attended at least once a week were categorized as high attenders. And so they measured this both in 1979 and then again in 2000. And then they also assess their cognitive health. And they ask them, first of all, to, to do a self-assessment of their memory. And then they, they used a test that's known as the serial sevens. And to do that, you simply begin at the number 70 and you subtract seven and you go backwards all the way down to at least 35 and beyond and they kind of look at how quickly you can do that and how accurate you are and that is an objective test of cognitive ability and the good news is is that what they found was that those who had high attendance both in 1979 and in 2000 had a statistically significant higher cognitive health than those who did not and this was even stronger for women. So the conclusion is, is that midlife adults who attend religious services on a regular basis between childhood and, and adulthood uh, do improve their cognitive health and their memory. Now, I should probably point out that the effect isn't just going to church. I mean, you don't get anything by just going and sitting in a pew, but this is what we would call a correlation. In other words, there's something about us as Christians and others who go to church very very regularly, and we are doing other habits that probably are helping our mental health. And that could include things like Bible study, our regular devotional time, outside reading. Maybe we have a habit of watching less TV. But whatever it is, going to church on at least a weekly basis uh, is a positive impact and should be encouraging to Christians so that you're building habits into your life that promote good cognitive health and better memory. Uh, 100, 93, 86, 79, 72, <laughs> 65, 58. How, um, you gotta, how, you gotta get good. all the way down to what before like you're gonna say, okay, stop, you're doing, you're doing okay with that. At least to 35. Okay. And then, um, so that's good. That's helpful. That's something I could practice. Um, just for the record, I cannot, I cannot do the alphabet backwards. It, I mean, st I'm stone cold sober all the time. I can't do the alphabet backwards. Is that, is that a sign of anything other than I can't do the alphabet backwards? I certainly hope not, because I don't think I can either. I, I don't know that I've ever tried. So uh, I think test. I'll just leave it at that. Yes, yes. That's a terrible, that's a terrible, terrible test. Um, okay, let's um, let's talk about one more thing, because I, uh, I found this to be um, particularly informative. And I think that as we engage with younger people, this is um, this is helpful to know. Um, talk with us about uh, what the CDC is reporting in relationship to teenagers and stress and substance abuse. Yeah, we've we've often hear about the declining mental health of our young people and specifically teenagers, and it's due to many different factors, and uh, it's always deeply concerning, and no doubt social media has a major part of that. But this particular study that just came out last week, the CDC took teenagers that had already been identified as being involved with substance use, and they wanted to know why. Why are they taking this? And so this was a survey of teens between 13 and 18 during the years of 2014 all the way through 2022. 
and they assessed them. And, and what they found is that 70, almost 75% were using these drugs, alcohol, to feel mellow or calm or relaxed. It wasn't so much to, to experiment or just have fun, though there were many that were doing it that way. The majority were using it to help them in their emotional turmoil. And a lot of them, almost uh, 45%, were doing it to sleep better. A lot of them to stop worrying and to deal with depression and anxiety. So that's, that's very worrisome. Whereas we used to talk about t trying drugs as a teenager just to have fun or experiment but now it's changing that they have so many mental health issues they're using drugs to kind of deal with them and help them cope most common drug marijuana not surprising uh, over 80 percent are using marijuana for that reason and that's particularly concerning because marijuana is now increasingly becoming legal around the country, including my state of Ohio. Next is alcohol and then non-prescription drugs and prescription drug misuse. So this is very concerning because marijuana is not the marijuana when I was in college. Uh, the, the levels of THC are much higher. And, and people should understand that even though you, you use marijuana, it will lift depression on a short-term basis, but actually it causes depression long-term. So for me, it's two reminders. Today's teens are facing unprecedented stress, no matter uh, what's going on, and they need parent presence with a Christian worldview to give them alternatives to deal with that stress rather than these drugs and alcohol. Yeah, I certainly want to encourage you um, today uh, to seek to build a bridge and a healthy relationship with a young person. Um, maybe teach them some stress reduction strategies. Go for a walk. Um, teach them some healthy coping skills. Um, encourage them in terms of the area of improving mental health. Like there, there are some things that we as adults can do to press in um, and encourage um, encourage young people. One of the reasons that they're turning to drugs and alcohol um, is because we haven't taught them how to turn to anything else. And so let's encourage them. I mean, you know, obviously from a Christian worldview, let's encourage them to turn to Jesus and let's uh, let's teach them practices like prayer, uh, which is going to be the subject of our next conversation um, here on Mornings with Carmen. Jeff, thank you so very much for being with us today and covering so many topics so well. My pleasure, Carmen. Yeah, it's always good. Always good to be with you. That's Dr. Jeff Barrows. You can find him at the Christian Medical and Dental Association, cmda.org. What are your um, anxiety or stress-reducing techniques? How does prayer play into that? Maybe spiritual journaling, maybe prayer walking, maybe, um, maybe meditative prayer. What are your practices of prayer? What is your prayer personality? Have you ever thought about the fact that you have a natural prayer style in the same way that you have a natural, you know, personality. You have a natural prayer style. We're going to talk with Janet McHenry next about praying personalities, how you find your natural prayer style and, well, and how you live into that. That's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. Janet McHenry is joining us. If you are not uh, familiar with her or connected to her, you're absolutely going to want to be JanetMcHenry.com. Uh, she is one of the people who has um, helped me in my journey um, as a Christian to develop a praying life, not just a prayer life. And so I'm thrilled to be talking with you today. Janet, welcome to Mornings with Carmen. Carmen, thank you so much for having me here today. I would like to start with, um, because you, you've written, I don't know, nearly 30 books. And so people could have like a whole shelf of, of Janet McHenry books on, uh, you know, like in their library. You have, um, you have a library as well. I wonder whose books on prayer or related to the praying life populate your bookshelf. I have about a shelf of books by um, my late friend, Jennifer Kennedy Dean, who wrote about 25 books on prayer. And it was she who helped me understand um, that it's less about having pockets of time for prayer. You know, like we have five minutes of prayer and we're done for the day. 
Um, so rather than having a prayer life, I should strive to have a praying life, that sense of being with God all day long. It's so um, it's so good, and that's one of the things I deeply appreciate about you um, and the invitational way you have taught me um, how to prayer walk. Um, that has been a real gift. Um, so I just want to, you know, if you're listening right now and you want a faithful friend uh, to walk with you into a into a life of prayer, not just uh, you know as she describes pockets of prayer, but a a a life of prayer, a prayer life. Um, then let me turn you on to Janet McHenry today. Um, Janet, you bring to us this brand new book, Praying Personalities, Finding Your Natural Prayer Style. Mine is conversational. I don't know if um, uh, if that's going to surprise anybody who's listening right now, but definitely my natural prayer t- style would be a conversational one. That's not really the way that you approach it, but when I um, when I thought about this jumping in, I thought that that's me. I I pray as this like ongoing conversation with God. I don't um, I don't feel like prayer is uh, when it's verbalized, when it's spoken, when it's shared. I don't feel like that's um, anything other than making audible what's inaudible all the time. That's actually what I hope every single person listening will find themselves in the place someday um, so that we, you know, we don't get to the end of our day, Carmen, and think, oh, hi, God, um, thank you for the day. But it is a running conversation that we actually do have with the Lord. Um, as situations come up, we, we might ask, why, God? Um, how, how are you here today with me? What is going on? You know, that sense of God's presence all day long. Yeah. So um, praying personalities is uh, it's not just good like prayer in terms of in terms of helping us understand prayer. This is really good in terms of helping us understand ourselves. Cause, so can you talk about your your passion for um, for understanding personality and how you bring that forward into this conversation? Right. So years ago when I was in my 30s, I really thought there was something wrong with me as a Christian person because I was not that joy like a fountain person. I was not that peace like a river person. I was not that love like an ocean person. Um, I thought there was something significantly wrong with me. And so someone recommended that I read a Christian book on personality. And I did. And then I read five more. (laughs) And I was actually in the middle of the sixth book when the writer said, you know, this particular personality will find themselves studying personalities over and over again. I thought, oh, no, close the book. (laughs) I get it now. Um, I have strengths. I have weaknesses. Let's, Let's work on the weaknesses, and God, use the strengths that I have to build your kingdom. I am like you. I have, um, uh, periodically throughout my life, like bought into the idea that my prayer life uh, could be more quote unquote organized or systematic than it is. Um, but once I realized that my prayer life is the one that I have with God, um, and it doesn't have to look like or sound like or reflect the pattern that somebody else, um, you know, m- have, might have found that works for them. I, I like you, like I, I have bought those prayer journals and those like organized tab ways of doing it. And the time, I mean, I just, none of that works for me. Like I'm, I'm just in the conversation with God, um, as an unfolding and ongoing sort of warp and woof of life, which I know is where you, like, (laughs) you're hoping that people get, but getting from wherever we are to that place is the journey, is the path that you walk us on. So take us into praying personalities. Because one of the things that I, I find particularly helpful that you offer is like a quiz. Like, how can I know what my praying personality is? So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. What are some of the ways of looking at per, praying personalities? And then how can I figure out what mine is? Well, I first started with um, a journey through God's Word to look at biblical characters to find out, is, is this even possible, Janet, you know, that we could have different ways of approaching prayer? 
And um, God showed me so many instances where people were praying in different manners. They were using different words. They were seemingly a, a different tone to their voices. They were approaching God. And we might think of someone like Moses, for example, who who argued with God for two full chapters in, in Exodus about why he couldn't lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And then we look to someone like Job, who simply wanted to understand his pain. And then once God answered him, he was, he was fine. And then someone like um, Hannah, who approached God emotionally, and we see her angst and her pain in 1 Samuel 1, and then we flip the chapter to the next chapter, and she's rejoicing, and she has thanksgiving. Um, David lamented in the Psalms, and the examples are, are many, Carmen. And so this gave me the idea that perhaps if we had a vehicle to help people understand uh, a little bit more about who they are, um, how they approach their spiritual life, how they communicate with God, that they, I could perhaps give them dozens, hundreds <laughs> of different ways that they could approach prayer. Um, so I created a little quiz. And uh, it's just 16 simple questions that people can take at prayingpersonalities.com. And it would help them understand, um, are you a problem solver? Do you approach prayer as, as problem solving? And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that because um, God is the problem solver, right? Or do you perhaps approach God as uh, as a friend, you see God as your friend, as your best friend. Um, is is prayer more of a relational kind of experience, such as you might have with a good friend over coffee? Um, and then there are two others as well: uh, the organized prayer or the lamenter that that person um, that we so greatly admire because she has a prayer journal and she writes out all our prayers or. Perhaps she has a systematic notebook where she keeps track. Um, and then there's the peace seeker. And this person approaches prayer for that purpose of having peace in their lives. They need that sense of peace. That's so good. Um, Praying Personalities is the book, Finding Your Natural Prayer Style. Janet Mc McHenry is the author more than happy to send you a direct link to Janet, but she's pretty easy to find, JanetMcHenry.com. If you go to PrayingPersonalities.com, you, um, you can check out the Praying Personalities quiz for yourself. When we come back, I am going to, um, I'm just going to read about a page and maybe a page and a half um, from Praying Personalities, and it's early on in the book where um, where we learn um, how Janet found her praying groove, because I think her testimony about finding her praying groove um, is just illuminating for all of us. So that's up next here on Mornings with Carmen. Receive a daily email featuring a scripture graphic. Sign up for the verse of the day email at myfaithradio.com. All right, what gets you out of bed in the morning? And when you get out of the bed, um, what do you do? Well, Janet McHenry started um, really as a practical answer to a need that she was experiencing in her life. Um, she started what she now calls prayer walking. She's written a great book on that subject. Um, and she's here today talking with us about her latest book, Praying Personalities. But early in Praying Personalities, she shares the testimony about how she started prayer walking um, and how that transformed not just her life um, in terms of uh, physically what she was experiencing and how she was feeling, but it actually transformed the way she was thinking. It shifted her mindset from a um, having a prayer life, like, you know, times uh, or even seasons during which we would pray, to a praying life, that moment-by-moment -moment ongoing conversation with God, um, the praying without ceasing. So um, on pages 14 and 15, uh, Janet shares this testimony um, of starting prayer walking, a practice that has changed her life. She says, you know, this was uh, just after her fourth child was born. She was a full-time working mom. She felt she didn't have time to exercise. 
Um, evenings were filled with kids' sports and practices and music lessons and um, volunteer work at the church. And she paid for that inactivity um, physically and acknowledged that she'd gotten overweight and needed over-the-counter painkillers to get to sleep at night. Um, and then one day she stepped out her kitchen door and found herself in a crumpled heap because her knee had given way. And so she needed, knew she needed to do something about her health, but she also knew that God was nudging her to spend more time with him. So how are you going to balance that? Like, how are you going to balance this, this, you know, you have this need in your life to improve your own health, your physical health, but you also know that you want more time with God. Well, get up and walk with him in the cool of the day. Get up and walk with him in the cold of the day. Get up and walk with God. And that is prayer walking. And it is a practice that um, has transformed Janet McHenry's life and through her writing and leadership has transformed the lives of so many others. And so uh, prayer walking is something I absolutely absolutely commend to you. And she testifies to it in um, in this book as well, Praying Personalities. Um, Janet, maybe talk with us, uh, for folks who aren't familiar with prayer walking, what does a person do when they are prayer walking? And what does God do in your experience while you are prayer walking? Well, lots of people uh, do a practice called prayer walking, and sometimes they started in the same way that I did. And that was simply to pray for what I call the minus of my life. You know, my kids, my marriage, my job as a high school English teacher. And that changed for me one day when I watched this young man hand over his little blanketed baby girl in front of the daycare center to the daycare center worker up on the sidewalk. And that little girl said, bye, daddy, I love you. And I knew right then that God had me out on the streets of my community less for the minus of my prayers, but more for the needs of others. And so actually, uh, lots of writers will say prayer walking is praying on site with insight, as Steve Hawthorne writes. Um, It is a practice that is intercessory in nature. You get outside of yourself. You get away from a lot of that mindness of your own prayers and open up your eyes to the needs around you. I believe, Carmen, that wherever we are, there is a need for prayer. And it's simply a matter of opening up our eyes and seeing where God has planted us right at that very minute so that we can pray for those around us. It's so good. Open my eyes that I may see is one of my um, prayer walking um lines sometime uh, when I'm prayer walking and I I just I feel like I'm kind of in a tunnel and I don't quite know what's going on in those cars and and houses and buildings you know around me that's just the prayer that I ask like open my eyes that I might see help me to see the people as you see them help me to see what's going on um, in this particular place where you have me um, help me see things that I otherwise wouldn't see without spiritual eyes. So I um, just want to invite you, if you're listening right now and you are not a prayer walker, um, let me just invite you into this particular uh, life of prayer, in this way of living prayer in real life. Today, uh, Janet is really here to talk about praying personalities. So um, Janet, when you when you think about the different people who you have encountered who approach God in prayer because they are wired the way they're wired, what are some of those distinctions? Like, how might a person with a different personality than you have approach prayer differently than you do? Sure. There are people who are more relational, for example, and I call those praying people friends of God. Um, They go to prayer because they have this relationship with God. They see him as their friend. Um, And perhaps they would find prayer most natural in a group of people. (laughs) My daughter, our oldest of four, has six kids. So I picture her in her mom van, you know, as she's driving the kids to music lessons, sports practices, and things like that, uh, saying, okay, Josiah, we're going to pray. You know, it's prayer time. Hello, everybody. Um, Josiah, you start, and then you decide who gets to pray next. 
you know, it's an experience. So it's more of a, a relational thing that they can have with friends because that's going to fill them. They're extroverted people and they love being in that companionship during prayer time with others. And then there's others who are more introverted in nature, right? Uh, those uh, who are more systematic, they have very particular disciplines in your life. Think of someone like perhaps like Daniel who uh, prayed three times a day, he fasted and he prayed three times a day. They have routines, they have disciplines. They might like having lists of prayer. I had a friend who said, Janet, you need to have this prayer notebook. It so works for me. And so on Sunday, you could pray for your um, your work friends. And on Monday, you could pray for your family. And on Tuesday, and on and on. And I started that, and uh, it worked for about a month for me. <laughs> but that person could, um, you know, they also might think of uh, creative ways. Perhaps there's a creative side to uh, that particular personality as well. Maybe they, as they're reading God's word, they want to journal. They put beautiful artwork in the margins of their Bible, and that's and they're praying and they're meditating over God's word in that way. They're just different ways, and there are hundreds of ideas uh, that I offer the reader, and uh, you know that we have lots of us are more extroverted in nature, more of us, some of our more introverted in nature. And then there are um, differences between those folks as well. Each of us so is different, and that's the freedom I really want to offer people, that I need not compare my spiritual life, my praying life with anyone else. God so created good. me uniquely. I am unique. Yeah, God wants to hear you um, talking with him. He wants to talk to you personally. And so he's going to do that in a way that resonates with you, um, and he wants to hear from you in a way that is natural for you. God's the one who um, who imagined you before the foundations of the earth, and he wants to hear from you in your voice. And so um, if you want some help with that, you want some help discovering your praying personality, we want to invite you into this liberating experience, prayingpersonalities.com. You can connect directly with Janet at Janet McHenry. Dot com. I'm more than happy to send you um, those direct links. Also, I uh, want to invite you, if you don't already have a plan, to participate in the National Day of Prayer. One of the hats that Janet wears is um, on the California leadership team for the National Day of Prayer, which is coming up on the first Thursday in May. And so and I want to invite you into that as well, that we might be people who pray together for our nation, its future um, and, and its leadership. All right, we are out of time today, and so I would be remiss if I didn't note that in addition to tomorrow being Valentine's Day, uh, today is also Fat Tuesday because tomorrow is Ash Wednesday. And so this is one of those be on your guard days. Um, Be alert, be aware, um, help speak truth into a world that is awash in all kinds of negative spiritual influences. I would say that um, when we talk about Mardi Gras, when we talk about Carnival, um, these have taken on aspects of the demonic that really do celebrate a spirit other than the spirit of God. And so let's guard our hearts and minds and speak truth today in love. Let's get out there into the world that God so loves. Let's do so in ways that honor Jesus. Have a great day and God bless. Thanks for listening to Mornings with Carmen LaBurge. Podcasts like this are available because of your support. If it's important to you to hear things that encourage your faith, Click the link in the show notes to give now. And thanks.